Our topic today is one of the most controversial. Because many parts of the world has already disregarded God's moral law. And we need to understand whether this allegation or interpretation is correct. Because we find in the internet hundreds of internets and thousands is telling God's law is a bolus, become null and void because of Christ that we are now in the grace dispensation. We are no longer bound to keep the law because we are not under the law but under grace. Is this concept correct? So let us do some analysis. God's moral law was abolished, abrogated. My question, by whom and when? Do the biblical writers of the New Testament support the idea? Or the interpretation that God's moral law has been abolished by the death of Christ? Therefore, Christians need not to be to keep the moral law of God. Or do the writers of the New Testament insist and conclude that those who do not keep the law or the commandments of God cannot inherit God's kingdom because they are transgressors? We will answer these questions through scripture in the final and ultimate standard of God's truth. Moreover, Paul says, the law entered that offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Romans 5.20 So grace is not necessary when there is no sin. Let me repeat that. Grace is not necessary when there is no sin. A sinner needs grace to save him because he transgresses God's law. God's grace requires law. But that law is that a broken law transgressed by a sinner. Therefore, as long as there is a sinner, a transgressor of God's law, there is. And grace is needed by the sinner. When sin increased, grace abounded more and more and more. To be saved by grace does not relieve anyone from the duty of obedience of God's law. Grace takes away the condemnation of the law, but it does not do away with the law. This is the reason Jesus, to whom the world, said to the woman, go and sin no more. There is a misconception throughout the whole world today. The world, the Christian world is really confused. Why? About God's law. There is no time in the history of the world that there is overwhelming confusion, distorting, maligning, misunderstanding, so bold and blunt, attacking, trampling, rejecting the law of God than our time today. For the mainstream Christian churches are teaching and preaching that the law of God, especially the moral law, the Ten Commandments, are already abolished when Jesus died on the cross. The Decalogue, as an old covenant, they said, is replaced. We are now in the new covenant, that we are not under the law, but under grace. That law-keeping is legalism. It undermines grace. Nobody being justified by the law. Nobody can keep it. My question, can all these reasons stand? No. All these sort of philosophical, subjective, theological bias are questionable, faulty, destructive, biblical understanding and interpretation of God's moral law. I have more question to ask. Are all these so-called theological, biblical reasoning that God's law already abrogated or abolished Really valid and not questionable? Are there any elements of truth in this argument? 
ko this extreme negative views of God's law are the views of the biblical writers. What is the assessment of Jesus regarding God's law? And what are the overall witness of the biblical writers regarding God's moral law in general and in particular? In the end, is the law of God against himself and against his people? Can God violate what he previously declared that represent his nature, character, and government? This question and other related questions demand honest answer from, a, from the Bible, the ultimate standard of truth. Let's compare God's law and God's character. God's law is holy. God's character is holy. God is love. God's law is love. God is perfect. The law is perfect. God is righteous. The law is righteous. God is just. The law is just. God is everlasting. The law is everlasting. God is unchangeable. The law is unchangeable. God is good. The law is good. God is true. The commandments are true. God is pure. The law of God is pure. God is faithful. The word of God, the commandment is faithful, upright, because all of this reflect God's character. How can we reflect God's character when we abolish God's law? There's a question. Let's discuss first. Jesus' relationship to God's law. The law of God was given through Moses for the people of Israel after they were saved from Egypt. It was central to the life of the existence under God. God's law was perfect, standard, by which they were to conduct their lives. Through the law was perfect, it revealed that people were so imperfect individuals. The problem was not the law, but people. Now, what the Bible says regarding the relationship of Jesus to God's law, Paul provides an answer. What when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. So Jesus was born under the law. But he was sinless under the law because he kept God's law perfectly. Because this word is the capital of those violators of God's law. We are not under the law. They don't understand the expression. So we're going to solve that. Under the law, Jesus had a perfect life of obedience to God's law. Jesus fulfilled God's law. That was given through Moses as he claims. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, 17. If in thinking it was not possible to break, to destroy, to annul, to stop, how much more with action? It speaks of absolute obedience and fulfillment of God's law. That's what Jesus did. As a model, Jesus challenged the people, which of you convicts me of sin? No one. I tell you the truth. Why you do not believe in me? Biblical writers are in the conviction that Jesus had no sin, which suggests he did obey God's law perfectly. Let us read with analysis and evaluation of some New Testament writers and other people about the sinlessness of Jesus. Because sin does not exist when you don't violate. When you don't transgress. Jesus had no sin, no blemish, no violation. That's why he was sinless because he did not transgress any of God's law. Let's look at the testimony of Paul. For he made him who knew sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
1 Corinthians 5.21 For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. In fact, Pilate, according to John, Pilate went out and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Here is none believer of Jesus. He has no sin. That's why John says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Because sin is lawlessness. Meaning, violation of the law. And you know that he was manifested, Jesus, to take away our sin. In him there is no sin. 1 John 3 verses 4 and 5. Let's go to Peter. For this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, living as an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. First Peter 2 verses 21 and 22. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamp without blemish, without spot. Jesus claims. He kept his father's commandment. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 10. Many people say, I love Jesus, but did not keep the commandments. You did not abide in his love. Because keeping his commandment is abiding in his love and we abide in the love of the father. Jesus is the only person who ever lived and kept the law perfectly. He did meet all the demands of the law. Never once breaking of any of its law and its commandment. Because that's why he was sinless. Jesus was able to meet the requirement of the law to be a perfect sacrifice. His death redeemed humanity from the curse of the law. Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become cursed for us, for it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on the tree. The curse of the law was removed by his perfect life and death, but when he died, he did not do away with the law. The curse was removed. Why you remove the law? His death means to those who previously slept under the law could become the children of God and heirs of his promises. Many around the world misunderstood God's law. Since Christ already redeemed the repentant sinners under the law, it does not mean that Christians no longer keep or obey the law. It is clear that the curse was removed, not the law. Therefore, the curse now falls on those who do not keep the law because they are the transgressor, they are the sinners. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful flesh, in the count of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the requirement, the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Why? For a carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life, because carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Romans 8, verse 3 to 7. What was condemned? The sin, not the law. Because sin is a violation of God's law. What do you mean by under the law? We find this expression in several writings of Paul. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his for his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are a sons, God has sent forth his spirit to his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore, you are no longer slave, but a son. 
ipasan din ear of God through Christ. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 7. Here, repeated under the law. But we are redeemed already. But it doesn't mean that we do away with the law. Christ has taken away the curse of the law. Now we can keep the law because now we are under the law of Christ. Was that? It's very interesting what Paul says. We are not under the law. But now we can keep the law because now we are under the law of Christ. Paul declares, carry each other's burden. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. There is. Galatians 6.2 The law is still to be kept. To be under the law means that a person is under the power, authority, obligation of law and judge and condemn if a person breaks that law. That's the meaning of what is mean under the law. So that's why Jesus correcting the Jewish leaders of the law. For Jesus says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God. Matthew 20. Who were the scribes and the Pharisees? The scribes were the most renowned teachers of the law. The interpreters of the law. The learned men. The expert of the law. The Pharisees related to this group were commonly viewed exemplary models of Judaism. The former seek Judaism to establish a code of moral and ritual more rigid than the spelled out in the law of God that he was given to Moses. Basing much on their practices of years of tradition, so the scribe and Pharisees were both highly strict and highly respected in Judaism. The Pharisee professed purest practice of righteousness. So when Jesus stated, one's righteousness must exceed that of scribe and Pharisees, this was a startling declaration. But the question, in what sense? The Pharisees will look up to those who have attained the very pinnacle of righteousness. The common people suppose such height of spirituality were far beyond their reach. But Jesus asserted that the righteousness of scribe and Pharisee did not measure, did not measure to entitle them to enter to the kingdom of God. What hope then? Did others have? In actual fact, they were in a deep problem with their righteousness. The heart of the matter that their righteousness was so defective in that it was only external. They appeared to obey the law to those who observed them but broke God's law inwardly. Where it could not be seen by others. Notice Jesus is skating denunciation of hypocrisy in making a show of religion. What do you scribe and parisi hypocrites? You cleanse the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside full of exhortation, extortion and self-indulgence. Indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. You also outwardly appear as righteous men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Did you get that? Expert of the law, and yet they are the best transgressor. There's something wrong. So, religious, they are so religious, but equally lawless. What is lawlessness? In Baker's Evangelical Dictionary, Biblical Theology says, Lawlessness is a rebellion against God. It's one basic meaning. Lawlessness is in direct opposition, rebellion to God. 1 John 3, 4. Righteousness is a condition 
characteristic of faith while lawlessness is the condition characteristic of unbelief. As the contrast continues, it becomes clear that the two categories have nothing in common. They are different as light and darkness. Jesus points out the people who claim to follow him, so religious, so busy with their works and prophecies and miracle, cut out demon in the name of Jesus, but in the practice lawlessness. This is church. He was not talking about those who don't believe in God. That's the context. We preach in your name. We drive demons. We do all these miracles. But God says, away from me, you lawless. Practicing lawlessness. I do not know you. It was the lawless people who killed Jesus. As Peter declares, you deny the Holy One, the just, and ask for a murderer. Here is the sterling. The stunning declaration of Jesus is so important. What Jesus' stunning declaration to the Jews during his time as he argued with the expert of the law. What in the final analysis, they were not expert of God's law. But the law that they made to suit their feeling and standard, not the law of God. In his arrow-like, sharp-pointed question, he said, did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keep the law? Did you understand that? God gave Moses his law. But no one keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? John 7, 19. What? No one keeps the law? They are expert of the law. Expert in violation of God's law rather than in keeping. It is almost the same today. People who read the Bible speak of law of God, law of Moses, law of Moses. But Moses had no law of his own. Similar blatant ignorant about the standard of moral living. What kind of glasses they are using for reading the law of God? Why they cannot see the law of God as a truth and the commandments of God? So we look at some of those expressions related to the law of God that are misunderstood by modern readers and most Christianity today. I call it, it the saddest truth. The claim, Abraham is our father. Jesus said, if you are Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. They were short of their claim. They asserted to have the law of Moses, but Jesus declared, If you believe Moses, you believe with me, for he wrote of me. John 5, 46. They do not obey or obey Moses. They neglect justice and love of God. John 7, 23. It's no wonder Jesus says, Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Claiming to have something but in reality, there was nothing. That is the saddest truth. This is what Jesus says, as I said. Therefore, the light in you is darkness. How great is that darkness. So, when we don't keep the law, we are dwelling in the dense darkness of spirituality. Look at the interview of Nicodemus with Jesus in the night. Why he came in the night? Because that night represents the spiritual darkness of the nation of Israel. For even the best teacher of Israel was stunned by Jesus' question. How these things can be? And the Lord asked you, you are the rabbi of Israel. You are the teacher of Israel. You do not know these things. This is a chaos. That is bankruptcy. Teacher of Israel of God's law, he did not understand earthly question much more with his spiritual questions. The situation is well described by Matthew. The people sat in darkness, have seen in the great light that is Jesus. They were sitting in the darkness, spiritual darkness. The light dawned, Matthew. 4 verse 16. The people of God sat in darkness in the shadow of death so miserably and pathetic. 
This is the background. My brothers and sisters who are saying the law was abolished. All privileges and opportunity were taken for granted. Stephen recounted the faithlessness and rebellion. Acts chapter 7, 39 to 52. Of the forefathers of the Jewish leader. And declared that who received the law by the direction of the angels have not kept it. Just imagine that. Expert of the law. They are not expert. Expert in violation. It's not the law of God. They have their own law. So, the hearers were guilty of the same sin of their ancestors. And so, they stone step into death. The reason is see incredible because they have all the opportunities and privileges to become what God want them to be. But utterly failed. All what they claim to be was not true. Are not the people today committing the same sin? Of the literal Israel in Jesus' day? Where we stand in the stream of time? What happened to the messages of the forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist? Matthew 23 was the real picture of God's people in Jesus' day. They controlled the mind of the people. Anything was speak against leadership, they wants to ostracize from the church, even Jesus Christ. Is that the expert of the law? Expert in violation of God's law. Several times Jesus indicated sheer ignorance of Jewish spiritual leaders on the word of God. The scripture, this is not irony, it is a paradox. Meaning to say, they say according to scripture, but they do not know the scripture. Today the same. People say, according to the scripture, the law of God was abolished. Which scripture? Whenever Jesus was charged of violating or transgressing the law of God or the law of God through Moses, the Lord would respond to the people, have you not read? What does it mean? They are not reading. If they read, read it wrongly. Interpret it mistakenly. Meaning Jesus directed the leaders and the people to read and verify. It implies they are not reading the law. They are blind, ignorant. For example, on the issue of Sabbath breaking, twice Jesus said, have you not read? Have you not read in the law? Matthew 12, 3, 5. Jesus justified what he did was in harmony with the law. In a close sequence, they would not accuse Jesus if they have read the law concerning the Sabbath observance. They are reading another law, not God's law. On the issue of marriage and divorce, Jesus said, have you not read? A passage directly quoted in Genesis chapter 2 verses 21-25. They failed to read Genesis 2. How ignorant. That's a very sad. Willful ignorance of the scripture again. On the question of the Messiah, Jesus used more strong and emphatic answer and repeated twice for accuracy. Have you never read? Have you never read? Wow. Today, we claim as the people of the book. We only read what sought to our test. What we like, how we live, we are so selective. Rather than understanding all things, people does not want to hear Bible truth, biblical truth. They have their own truth, which is not truth. Just imagine that. In other words, Jesus asks, you are reading nothing about it? In one occasion, the Lord asked, have you not read in the book of Moses? Or have you not read? Repeat it again. Mark 12, verses 6 and 10. Here is the totally ignorance. 
Because Jesus would not do it. If they are really reading the Bible. Fortunately, as I read the Gospels, very only few was able to answer. The question of a lawyer. Jesus said, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Luke 10, 26. 26. Jesus commanded, yeah, you have the right answer correctly. Do this and live. Only the lawyer. Spiritual leaders. Chaos. Bankrupt. Because they read only those things that suit their minds and tests and practice in life. They are not reading actually the scripture and the word of God and the law of God. So let's look at theological analysis. Indeed, the people of God, Israel, during Christ's time was in deep spiritual darkness in the Lord's evaluation. But to them, they were brilliant shining light. What a pathetic estimate. They did not read another scripture. Neither they know the law of the Lord or Moses, nor followed the life of faith and obedience of Abraham. The question is why? Because they equated God's law, the scripture, with their own oral and written tradition. Jesus, with a strong emphasis, marked these wrong ideas. Repeatedly in Matthew chapter 15 and Mark 7, that the word of God was replaced by the work of the tradition and become their authority as scripture and genuine scripture was bereft by its own power and its, its own authority. We find that today in many churches. The action of the word is final. But the question is about the scripture. What the leader says is correct. Is that so? Unless our leaders are really guided by the Holy Spirit, your authority is questionable before God. Especially when you destroy those people, those members of the church that Jesus died on the cross. What is the meaning of the phrase law of Moses? Many have misunderstood this expression. Law of Moses has been repeated. Law 2, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9, Hebrews 10, 28. The question, does Moses have any law of himself he gave to Israel? That is misnomer. Moses had no law. The Hebrew word behind Moses. Through Moses, given through Moses. The honest answer is nothing. He has no law. Why attributes to Moses as a lawgiver? When you carefully read Genesis to Deuteronomy, Moses had no personal agenda of giving in law, for there is only one God and lawgiver, judge, king, and savior. According to Isaiah 33, 22 and James 4, verse 12. Had already been given all what are needed. So when readers of the law or the Torah, the five book of Moses, authored by Moses, people are thinking that this law are Moses' law except the Ten Commandments. Wrong! How careless! How prejudiced! How surface readers! Represents... References cited above should be understood in immediate context. For example, Luke 2 says, The law of Moses, but taken from original source, the Lord spoke to Moses about the laws of purification. It's not laws, it's Moses' law. How do you read? There is something wrong. The repeated formula is clear. The Lord spoke to Moses in giving all kinds of instruction about God's law. Here is a lot of text. I analyze that the whole book of Moses, the Pentateuch, and the repetition is that all the Lord has given to him as the commandments to them. 
You read the entirety. But in the book of Deuteronomy, because it is a summary, he just quoted, but if you try to go back from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Moses had no single law. I don't use that expression. It is God's law. It was given to Moses because he was the leader, representative of God to the people of Israel. And so, this law are not given to Moses. It was given to Moses for the children of Israel. It was not the law of Moses. Again, this expression is misunderstood. The law, prophets, and some. This expression, law and prophets, which Jesus used the two divisions of the Old Testament, the law or the Torah, are the five books of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy. The prophets are the major prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, minor prophets, Isaiah to Malachi. Sometimes used, Jesus used three divisions, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. In Luke 24, the meaning, the entire Old Testament books. The moral law is a different. The Decalogue is distinctly different. The Ten Commandments is different and distinct from all other laws. All other laws like civil, social, health, family, agricultural law, and many other laws were given to Moses as God spoke to him. And Moses wrote them. But the Decalogue was not. God personally wrote the Ten Commandments with splendor, glory, majesty, power, and authority. It was so a special gift to the newly created people of God. So when the expression law of Moses, know that the Decalogue is exclusive law of God. Where Moses and all Israel had to be and keep. Although it was recorded in the book of Moses. So when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You know when you trace up where did Jesus get that? In the heart of Exodus 20. He took it from the Ten Commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. He's directing to the moral law. Especially given. That's why God's law is both offensive and ugly. Delightful and beautiful. Reason why. Christians throughout the whole world are divided in their understanding of God's law. Majority defied, violated, ignored, slighted, disregarded, hated God's law. The minority, on the contrary, they love, they revered, they honor, they keep, they obey, uphold his law as God's will for human happiness. The wonder of all mysteries, of all wonder, is that Christians have the same Bible, why perspective diametrically opposed to each other. The answer is not easy, but the fact that the Bible reveals that those who treat God's law in negative light, as Paul asserts, to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace because carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Indeed, those who are in flesh cannot please God. It's very clear. Besides that, there are teachers today, thousands of them in our world. Who are these teachers? Let's read Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of this commandment and teaches other though the same will be called less. Ah, when you relax in your teaching in keeping God's law, Elakestos in Greek is a tiny in heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great, mega in the kingdom of God. Two kinds of teacher. The tiny, which is nothing, and the mega, the great teachers. The word list means tiny or small, insignificant, so equal to nothing. Compared to the great, the mega, something significant, the least, 
are those who think negative about the law of God. Claiming that the law was abolished, abrogated, made null and void, whereas the mega are the great teachers, are those who uphold, revered, magnify, keep them as a holy reflection of God's righteous character. The role of love and law. From the standpoint of God, both in the Old and New Testament, love is a command and a law. Remember that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love is commanded. Why is this? For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. He will save our Savior. He will save us. Isaiah 32, 22. God, beside his work as a creator, he is also a judge, a lawgiver, a king, and a savior. So, he asks, teacher, which is the great commandments of the law? Wow. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment and the second you love shall love your neighbor as yourself. God's law is both a command and love. It is a role of love and role of law. Don't miss that. However, there is really a function of the law. Many misunderstood the function of the law. I opened a website. There was a posting of 37 texts in favor of the arguments that Christians are not under the law but under grace. In other words, no need to keep the law of God. The sticks are their weapons. We're going to dismantle their arguments in favor of keeping God's law. First, we need to cite the text and evaluate. I did not revise the argument. And they are italized in red. My answer here are short and colored blue. For I will discuss the different function of the law later. So here, the one who posted it the website, he put the law as so ugly. It is ugly for those who do not keep it the law. They said, cited Acts 15.10, the law is unbearable you. Is that so? The issue in the text and context in verses 5 has nothing to do with moral law but circumcision. But which Judaizer imposed to the Gentile converts? Do you understand? There's something wrong. The law is unbearable. It means the moral law. It's not the moral law. It is a law of circumcision. Wrong reading. Wrong interpretation. In Romans, he says, the law reveals sin, but cannot fix it. Yes. It's true. Because one of the functions of the law is to reveal sin. A person is a violator. The law does not function in fixing sin. It is Christ who fixed. Wrong. Third argument. If the law worked, then faith would be irrelevant. What? Sounds correct but misunderstood because by faith Abraham was not in conflict with the law verse 16 because he believed by faith in God but he kept all God's law did you understand how do you read there's something wrong in reading they argued the law brings wrath upon those who follow it is that so Wrong interpretation. By not considering the whole verse, for it says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the transgressor brings God's wrath on him because he failed to keep the law. <laughs> Twisting. This is really a deception of the devil. Next argument. The purpose of the law was to increase sin. Yes, that's correct. 
But the function of the law for us is to see and understand the sinfulness of sin and its result just to review the sin of stealing of Achan in Joshua 17 to 26. The king, Josiah, and many others. The purpose of the law is really to tell you that to commit, to violate that is increasing sin. Look at what happened. See, so, I just keep and the, what happened. They were already informed, do not take anything. So what happened? Judgment. Terrible judgment. This is a blunt interpretation. To see specific discussion, I will discuss that later. How one would square with Hebrews 5, 9. So he become the author of eternal salvation, all who obey him. Wow. He is the author of salvation to those who obey. And you just gather text out of context, wrong interpretation. You malign the law because it suits your own idea. That is not biblical exegesis. That is exegesis. Personal opinions. Our authority is the word of God. Hebrews 10, 16. I will put my laws in their hearts, in their mind. I will write. Is the law done away? No. How dare you are to abolish God's law? That's why I asked that in the beginning of this presentation. Who abolished? When? There's something wrong with the reading. Again, the argument, the law promises life brings death through sin. When one transgresses it, Yes, it brings death. But if you keep it to the end, because Jesus says, I know the meaning of his commandment. It means eternal life. John 12, 15. 15. That's why I keep, I love God. Because the only sure is evident that I love the Lord is to keep and obey his law. So this is against Jesus' statement. To enter life, keep the commandments. Why you violate? You cannot enter life. You enter hell. The law makes you sinful beyond measure. That's their argument in Romans 7. The same answer with the argument in Romans 10. The law is weak, yes. But this is wrong. A man who can keep the law is weak, not the law. The law is always strong. It's the human flesh who does not obey. It's weak, not the law. And they read 2 Corinthians 15, 26. The strength of sin is law. Yes, it is because law cannot justify sin, but condemn the guilty transgressor. You find that in Romans 3, 20, 14, 15, and chapter 7, verse 8. You see, we don't need to keep the law because the law is a ministry of death. 2 Corinthians 7. Again, it is not in the context of law keeping, but the hardness of the mind of people. Be a good interpreter. Do not blah, blah, blah. If you are ignorant, keep quiet. You are causing thousands of people to transgress God's law. In the day of judgment, you will be judged because you malign the law. The holy, the just law of God. The argument is a ministry of condemnation. The law has no glory at all in comparison with the new covenant grace. The law is fading away. Anywhere the law is preached, it produces mind hardening and heart hardening veil. Quoting 2 Corinthians chapter 3 14. Yes. But this refers to this who were blinded by the devil because they did not believe. They have hardened minds so they cannot see the character of God in God's law. That's the correct interpretation. The argument continues. The law was our prison. Wrong. This is contradictory analysis to James. Chapter 2 verse 8 and 12. 
Speaking of God's law, he says, the royal law, the law of liberty, it is liberating rather than a prisoner. I'm defending the law because it's a liberating. It's a law of liberty. It's a law, a royal law, and you claim it as a prisoner. The transgressor is a prisoner, will go to prison, not the keeper. Even in our land, transgressor of the law of government, you will be in prison. But you are a keeper, you can go anywhere. There is no harm. You did nothing wrong. Can you see that? So, you see, oh, the law justifies nobody. Galatians 2, 16. Yeah. But we need to understand, Paul says, if you are not doers of the law, but the doers of the law are justified. Romans 2.13. The law does not justify. But it can be justified when you obey. Because when you violate, you are a violator. The argument goes on. Christians are dead to the law. Galatians 2.19. But... It, it means, verse 18, the transgressor of the law is dead because the wages of sin is death. We need to understand that. It's not the keeper. It is the violator who are dead. The keeper is not. The Christian keep the law until death. Not open on. Romans insist that. Romans 7, 1 and 2. And their best argument is that the law prostrate God's grace. Hmm. The law functioned in God's purpose as temporary covenant from Moses till Jen and announced, Baptist announced it. Ah, they said, we can only keep the law until Jen. Wrong reading. This is wrong. The law continued to its eternal function on a solid ground, starting from Christ, the correct interpreter of the law, and the race of the New Testament writer. If there is no law, there is no sin. Why sin is so destructive for all New Testament writers if it was temporary? The law make you slave like Agar. Galatians 4. Christ has abolished the law with a wall to hostility. Wrong interpretation. The context do not warrant moral law was abolished. Paul was talking about the division of the Gentile and the Christian because the Jews look at them as people of God and the Gentiles as non-part of the commonwealth of Israel. Wrong interpretation. Paul considered everything low gain him as his cabalon with Greek. Poop. Philippians 4. This is it. Yes, West. But again, the verse 9 is omitted in the argument. He is only up to verses 4 and 8. But verse 9, which is the answer, he did not. Because he said, the righteousness by faith, but not the law of righteousness. Get that? The law is good if you use it right in context. So next, the verse, read the next verse, it's correct. It was made for the unrighteous, but not for the righteous. That's their argument. Uh -huh. A pastor told me, you keep the law because you are a violator. How? How do you dare to say to me? Who is a violator? The keeper? Or the one who does not keep? Because why is it? People want to, to learn that, to tell us that they are really, they're not violators. But we need to understand, everyone is condemned. Paul says in Romans, who is righteous before God? Not one, for all have under sin. Get the point? It's universalist. Whole people are sinners. And then, then you see, it was given only to people who are unrighteous? Who is righteous anyway? If you claim you're righteous, your righteousness according to Isaiah, it says, as filthy as rags. What is filthy rags? 
In Hebrew word, it means translated Begid Idim. So that we can understand. Begid Idim, rags, is a cloth used by women in their monthly cycle. That's our righteousness. Oh. So, the law is weak, uh, useless, makes nothing perfect. Be quoted Hebrews 8, 7, verses 19. God has found fault and created a bitter covenant, enacted bitter opportunities. Be quoted Hebrews 8, again, verses 7 to 8. It is obsolete, growing old, ready to banish. Be quote Hebrews 8, verse 13. Again, wrong. Because this chapter does not tell about the moral law. It tells about Levitical priesthood that was changed in Aaronic to Melchizedek. Not verse 10. God will write his law in their hearts, becomes their God, and he becomes their people. Weak. Do not read statement out of context. Because your ignorance is exposed. It is only shadow of good things to come and will never make someone perfect. Is that the law? The moral law of God? Wrong. This is ceremonial law. The law of daily, yearly sacrifice that the moral law. You read verse 10, verse 1, 5 and 8 of Hebrews. Almost all verses cited in the moral law was abolished, abrogated. Not a single line has a solid ground for negating the moral law. The interpretation is weak, out of context, selective, biased, prejudice against God's law. A simple question, where, where there is sin, because the moral law is still valid. So, those who see God's law as a reflection of his character, the law is so beautiful. God's moral law functions as a guide, the way of life. By keeping them as God's will for happiness. Read. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. Psalms 119, 165. I will hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. 119, verse 163. The law of your mouth is better for me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Psalm 119, 172. My whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. These are the reason for those who love God's law. Why you give a black stigma on God's law? Because you don't keep God's love. There is a Latin expression. Jora Lex said Lex. It is harsh, but it is law. To them, it is harsh. It is harsh when you don't obey. God has given us grace to keep God's law, not our own. To many, the law of God is harsh. It's cruel for the transgressors. It, it makes a violator unhappy, guilty, disturb their conscience and condemn them because they are hostile to God's law. But once you understand the full nature of sin and the penalty, we can see God's law is so amazing expressions of love. Your righteousness and everlasting righteousness. Your law is truth. Psalms 119, 140. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one that of the law becomes void. Luke 16. And you make it void? Heaven is still here. Who are you? You are a violator. Change your preaching. I challenge you. That's why our society is in chaos. Because you say, don't keep the law. You are spreading lies and deceiving our young people. And many of them go to prison because the preaching, there is no need of law. Don't keep the law of the land. You landed in prison. You are a criminal. How about what? God's kingdom. The law is not a problem. It is us. Therefore, the law is holy. The commandment is holy, just and good. 
Paul says that in Romans 7.12. The end of the matter has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandment, for this is the whole duty of man. Are you a man? If you are not a man, don't keep God's law. Even nature, they keep, follow God's law, the natural law. Because God will bring every dead into judgment with every secret, whether good or evil. One day, you'll stand in the bar of God answering why you'd say it is abolished, it is destroyed, it is null and void. It stands forever. But we know the law is spiritual. I am carnal, sold under sin, Paul says. In Romans 7, 14. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just or the law is disobedient because I said all of us have been condemned because no one is righteous. The law is a way of life when you are saved. But if you are a violator, the law will tell you to find back and stay in God's law because that is the way of life. So, let me go to the diagnostic function of the law. Now we know whatever the law says. It says to those who are under the law that every mouth be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. Whoa! Who is guilty? Those who are violators of the law. Not the keepers. The more we know the law, the clearer it becomes that we are not obeying it. This in turn lows us that we are guilty. Just because the law makes us guilty, we will not obey the law. Wrong. Because the law is the knowledge of sin. It's the valid reason not to keep the law because it's a knowledge of sin. No, we would rather keep the law to see clearly sin in all its totality and misery and its consequences. The law does not function to justify a sinner, but to condemn, to avoid condemnation, you keep the law. We must keep the law. Why? Because if there is no sin, there is no law, no savior, what you're going to do. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Because there is no law, no sin. Therefore, no need of a savior. When you're preaching Jesus coming, receive him. Because there is still a law. That's why the savior was born. Name him Jesus because he saved their people from their sin. Matthew 1.21. They sin because they transgress God's law. Why so many violators of God's law? Because the devil and his agents is making war against God's law. For he's a murderer, a liar, a father of lies. As, John, as Jesus said in John 8.44. This term murderer, liar, do not stand in truth. There is no truth in him. It's from the law of God that the devil and his agents had violated. Violator of God's law has no truth because God's truth, because your law is truth. Psalms 119, 142. Look at what the Bible says. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Ah! Those who forsake, violate the law, praise the wicked. The wicked here is Satan. You praise Satan. You magnify, you glorify Satan when you could not keep God's law in a proper perspective. Those who keep the law strive against them. Wow. Who is the wicked river here? It's the devil and his allies. Therefore, just one man through sin entered the world. They through sin thus spread all men and because all sin. It brings death. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, the body of sin might be done away with, and we should no longer be slave to sin. Because sin is leaving us. The function of the law for the sinner. Oh, do you not know, brethren, that I speak those who know the law? Ah, be 
because people in the time of Jesus did not know the law. He said, the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Get it? Until the day we die, we need to keep God's law. Not because to be saved. Because that is his will. That is our rule of happiness. Just violate one. Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's wife. What happened? You steal. You profane. Did you understand? That you are in the biggest problem? That's why Paul say, Shall we say then, is the law sin? No! On the contrary. I would not have known sin except through the law. I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not commit but sin, taking opportunity of the commandment, producing me all manner of evil desire. Apart from law, sin was dead. It's not the law that is dead. It is me who is a sinner. So the commandment which brings to life, I found bring death if we violate it. So sin through commandment might become exceedingly sinful. That's the function of the law. The function of the law does not justify us. That does make us righteous. It is Christ who makes us righteous. It does not save us. If you read the Ten Commandments, verses 1 and 2 of Exodus 20, God save, then they keep. But if we reverse that, we keep so that we will be saved, you end in hell. That's clear. And many people are revising that. No. You can only keep the law because God already gave you grace to keep it. You are already saved. So that's how we maintain we walk in our Christian life. How do you like that you are a neighbor violator of the law of the land? No one will be happy. So, it does not justify. Paul says in Galatians 3.24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. It's not to cleanse us. In fact, the James says, The law is a mirror. No matter how expensive is your mirror, it cannot cleanse you, but it will point only to your death, how ugly you are. And since you see there is something wrong, you find who can cleanse it and remove. It is only Jesus and his grace and his love. Bold and daring. So, you cannot find a single text that those who keep the moral law who love Jesus and his word are violators. No one can read that one text that those who keep God's commandment and those who love Jesus are violators. On the contrary, all those who transgress God's law are violators, transgressors, and rebellious. People who transgress God's law claim they're walking the light, but actually they're walking in a dense darkness. Jesus and the gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Paul, Peter, and Jude, and John, uphold God's moral law much more in the Old Testament writers. If the allegation of many Christians that the law has been abolished, nullified, and abrogated, why the portrayals of the book of Revelation, violator, transgressors, are horrible? Think. But the race of mankind were not killed by the plagues. They did not repent their works of their hands. The worship should not worship Demons and idol, gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which cannot see or hear walk. They did not repent their murder, sorcery, sexual immorality, or theft. Wow. This is from the Ten Commandments. If we abolish, why it is here? This is from commandment number one, two, four, six, seven, and eight. Therefore, the law is still abiding. Commandment number four. It's about true worship. If anyone worship his image, receive the mark forever and ever, they have no race and die, and they will go into the hell of fire. You see? You want us 
to go to go with you in, in the hill of fire? This is the punishment of the disgracers of commandments 1 to 4. The moral law related to worship of a true God. How would you justify that the law was abrogated? Open your minds, my brothers and sisters, who are not keeping God's law. Look at here. Come gather together for supper. The great God that you may eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of the captain, the flesh of the mighty men. The beast was captured with him, the false prophet who works signs in his presence, which deceives and worship the image, the steward cast into the lake of fire, the bone of Again, these are violators of the law of worship. If God's law or true worship of the decalogue is abolished, the violators are abolished, not God's law. Would you continue to violate God's law? Or obey because you are already saved? Look at again. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderer, sexually immoral, sorcerer, idolaters, or liars have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21.8. There is no law. Abolish. You listen. Outside the city, the city of God, are dogs, sorcerers, sexually immoral, murderers, idolaters, whoever loves practices lie. Did you see? You cannot go to the kingdom of God. More or less, these are violators of the Ten Commandments. The law of God has never been abolished. So repent and keep God's commandment and have faith of Jesus Christ. The surety to enter to the city of God. The surety is to accept Jesus as personal Savior. Obey all his word as he says. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Luke 6.46 If you love me, keep my commandments. Blessed are those who do his commandments. They may have the right to a tree of life. And you may enter through the gates of the holy city. Wow. Exactly opposite of what people are preaching against God's law. If you want to go to heaven, do the commandments. You have the right to the tree of life and to enter the holy city of God. If you cannot enter because you are the violators. Change your interpretation. I want to end this presentation. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus did not abolish us, nor make it null and void. It is a way of life for those who keep for our own happiness. Violate, you have a lot of trouble, and you have trouble with God. Because this is an indication and evidence that we love our Lord Jesus Christ. May what I have presented, I have against nothing. I'm only against wrong of handling scripture, especially in talking of the moral law, which is the way of life and happiness. If you love me, Jesus says, keep my commandment and a surety in the entrance of God's holy city. If you are violators, you are outside the city. May I call your decision from this time when you hear this message. And may you love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind. It's a command because God loves you and he loves me. We have to keep his commandments as an evidence of a true disciples and a true candidate of heaven. Let us not reverse what God has done. You are saved. That's why you are to keep the law. Do not keep the law so that you will be saved. Because when you keep the law so that you will be saved, you go to hell. Remember this. This is the truth. Thank you.